Um, the last two weeks, we kind of just talked about a bunch of introductory things. We talked about, you know, who wrote it, when it was written, that kind of stuff. Um, last week, we looked at, you know, um, uh, the, one of the big things that we looked at last week is some ways, some ways, not all the ways, but some ways that the book applies to single people. Um, so we're going to go uh, verse by verse today, um, but we're not going to spend a whole lot of time. I hope to be done with Song of Solomon within two weeks. So that just kind of tells you our time frame right there. Um, obviously not – oh, no, never mind. Um, the, I'm going to read it out of the CSB because I think it's a lot easier to flow with, but I'm going to show you the points that I disagree with how they broke up who is speaking. And I'll bring those up as we get to them. So just as a reminder, this is the outline here. It starts in three basic – it has three basic main sections, the first section being the courtship or the dating or the engagement, however you want to say that. Um, that's one, two through three, five. Uh, then there's the wedding, the actual wedding process itself, which is uh, three, six through five, one. And then married life is from five, two to eight, four, and then it has this little conclusion thing, but we'll get to that when we get to the end. Um now, I, I brought up that there's a couple different ways to understand Song, Song of Solomon. Uh, to make things easier, let me just tell you how we're going to look at it. We're not going to look at it with the idea of it's about a, you know, a country girl and her shepherd lover and Solomon is an intruder. We're not going to look at it at that version because I, I don't think there's enough warrant for it. For, first off, it says in verse 1, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon. So if Solomon was the outsider and the man that was – the lover is some other guy, then that kind of just makes things very complicated. And why would it be Solomon's song if Solomon's the outcast? So we're going to look at it with the idea that Solomon is the guy. okay? Um, and it seems very likely that she is just a commoner. She's not royal nobility or anything like that. Um, there are a lot of metaphorical love or sexual innuendos. Um, where it's like, for instance, they'll be talking about one thing, but you know that they're actually talking about something else. Like, uh, for instance, vineyards is, is a common uh, metaphor, and obviously they're not always talking about actual Grapes. vineyards. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, we'll start off with the engagement period. Uh, chapter, uh, I, you know, I didn't really uh, – chapter 1. We'll start in chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, I didn't realize how awkward this is going to be to read this out loud, guys. <laughs> So, <laughs> should I go get my grandma? Oh, please do, please do. You know, my mom, my mom is so funny. She was all like, you know, I I heard that Song of Solomon was was about sex when I was a kid. So I went to read it, and I was just so disappointed. <laughs> I was like, what does that mean, mom? What does that mean? <laughs> anyways, anyways, my mom's just funny. Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, oh that he would kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your caresses are more delightful than wine. The fragrance of your perfume is intoxicating. Your name is perfume poured out. No wonder young men adore you. Take me with you. Let's hurry. Oh, that the king would bring me to his chambers. Um, so that's the first bracket, and that seems to be the woman speaking. I, I'm in agreement with the CSB. Um, so there's a few things here. In 2 through 4, it looks like she's talking mostly about fantasy. Y you've, you've been young and in love before, right? That kind of seems where she's at here. You know, she's just fantasizing about about just being with him. It's not she's not fantasizing about sex. She's just fantasizing about just spending that time with him. Um, but if you know, notice she she includes all of her uh, senses here. You know, okay, so she's wanting him to him to uh, kiss her, the caresses, and then she gets down here the fragrance of your perfume, so the smell. Um, no wonder young women adore you. The, the how people see you, and it's just a whole package deal. Um, and then uh, if you notice here, she says specifically your name is perfume poured out. This guy had a good character. Now, obviously, Song of Solomon is about you know love and that kind of stuff, but it's important to remember to be wise with who you love. <laughs> I think I think that's good enough to say there. Just don't don't uh, don't fall head over heels for idiots. Let's just kind of. Yeah. <laughs> anyways. Um, so then there's a little bit of a, a disagreement in some verse, in some translations based on the end of verse 4. It says oh, – in the CSB, it says, oh, that the king would bring me to his chambers. Other ver versions say the king has brought me uh, to his chambers. So there, it's debatable which one is right. Um, I think the CSB makes it, sound, makes it flow a lot better because she's talking about these things that she's fantasizing about. 
and so she desires to go to his chambers, not necessarily in a sexual way, but more of in an intimate way. Um, so his chambers would be so they can get alone, okay? Not necessarily for sex, but, you know. Um, however, if if her point is that the king has brought me to his chambers, then that more implies that he saw her and decided that they needed to just get alone to just kind of do their thing. Not necessarily sex, once again. Just be together. Um <clears throat> So more of a private interaction or fantasy. Maybe it's just simply in her imagination that, that you know the king brought her into his chambers. Kind of unclear. Um, I personally go for how the CSB words it. I think it kind of just hits the flow very nicely. Um, so then we get to verse the end of verse 4, which isn't her talking anymore. It's what's – in some Bibles is called uh, young women. So some people have asked, okay, what, what is that? What is that? Okay, so there's the possibility of it being Solomon's harem that join in the song. I think that's less appealing. <laughs> Possible, I guess, though. Um, another uh, idea is that it's just the young women of Jerusalem. So in other words, it's more of like uh, the girls, maybe the girls' friends or just neighbors and that kind of stuff. Uh, kind of like when you're watching a musical and, you know, they're doing their thing and then, like, there'll be just, like, the random people on the street that join in on the song. Kind of like that. Um Either way, they're not overly a very important character, th this chorus of people. Um, so we're not going to spend any more time on that. Um, it's, uh, but however, there is a very important point to be sing said from what they what they um, sing here. We will rejoice and be glad, and you will celebrate your crests more than wine. So rather than being kind of indignant at the idea of her, her young love, which I think is the most common, um, you know. Uh, right. Feeling. When you see young young lovers, you're like, ugh. Yeah. You know what I mean? Tell me you don't. <laughs> okay. I mean, tell me you don't hate it. <laughs> you know, and they're all over each other and stuff. It's like, ugh. Yeah. Kill me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, sure. uh, but still there's the idea here of rejoicing in other people's joy. Um, you know, when people do find love, it is a good thing. You know, it is a good thing. As awkward as sometimes they make it, <laughs> it is still a good thing. Um. So then in ver at the end, very end of verse 4, in the CSB, it attributes this back to the woman. It, it is only right that they adore you, which I don't think is right. I think it's actually – that should belong to the chorus. We will ce celebrate your caresses more than wine. It is only right that they adore you. People adore you. In other words, she's just such a wonderful you know, person. person or young lady or whatever. Um, if it is her that just sang it. Um, it, I, I don't know if it really makes sense other than he, she's talking about the king. It is only right that the people adore you, King Solomon, right. which once again is possible. So um, that takes us to her second uh, little talk here from verses 5 through 7. Daughters of Jerusalem, I am dark like the tents of Kedar, yet lovely like the curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am dark, for the sun has gazed on me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me take care of the vineyards. I have not taken care of my own vineyard. Um, so then in verse 7, Tell me, you whom I love, where do you pasture your sheep? Where do you let them rest at noon? Why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? So uh, there's a few things. First off, uh, she worked outside in her youth, which actually wasn't that uncommon uh, for women in, in the Middle East. Um and it left her left her skin uh, tanned. So there is um, the point here. We have two ma two meanings of, of the word vineyard here uh, in verse six. The first one is literally she was working in their vineyards, literally. But then it says I have not care taken care of my own vineyard. Here it switches to somewhat of a metaphorical. In other words, she had to take care of other people's stuff, but she wasn't really able to take care of herself, which is why she has dark skin that's her whole point there um then in verse seven it says tell me you whom i love where do you pasture your sheep uh so um rather than being insecure alone wandering around as a mourner she decides to go to her lover because okay so when you separate two young lovers what's what do they do they pine after each other right mm -hmm. so rather than being that insecure alone little girl oh or you know rather than wandering around mourning for her lost lover oh Oh, if only I could be with him. You know how yeah. young people are. Uh, <laughs> she decides to go to go find this guy, um, Solomon. And that takes us to verse 8. If you do not know most beautiful of women, 
Follow the tracks of the flock and pasture your young goats near the shepherd's tents. Now we have two main ideas of what he, what this means here, depending on who's talking. If it's Solomon, like the CSB says that it is, then he's more of talking to her in a joking manner, like, you know, come find me. If it's the onlookers, it can be attributed more to sarcasm. Do, do, uh, do you have nothing better to do? Don't you know? Follow the tracks. Go, go. You know what I mean? Kind of like an irritated kind of thing which is kind of how i would respond <laughs> if some young teen you know some young girl is pining after her lover it's like well go look for him jeez what am i your your lover's keeper <laughs> but anyways um so then that takes us to verses 9 through 11 which um is the man speaking i compare you my darling to a mare among pharaoh's chariots a mare is a horse um so a mare among uh, Pharaoh's chariots, your cheeks are beautiful with jewelry, your neck with its necklace. We will make gold jewelry for you, accented with silver. So before you get too offended um, at the whole idea that he just called her a horse, <laughs> uh, Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's mares were very highly prized. So he's actually comparing her to something of great worth. Now in the Middle East, this, even, this has even more meaning to it. Uh, because unlike where people out here just have horses, maybe just to ride them just for fun, um, horses were actually very, uh, very valuable. Yes. So for him to compare her to that, he's more saying you're highly prized. You you are very well uh, maintained. Maybe would be a word. Um, um, well, you're pleasing to look at. You're useful. Well, kind in, of a. In Native Americans' tradition, the, they will still. Yeah, yeah, that's true. They still do that. Yeah, yeah. But anyways, um, and so then um, in verse 11, he goes on about how he's going to get, give her gifts. Now, once again, this is what young lovers do. They give each other gifts. So he says, um, we will make gold jewelry for you, accented with silver. So really what we have here is just this dialogue between this this, this man and this woman. They're just crazy about each other. Um, and uh, that, that's where this is going so far. Now, in verse 12, it switches back to the woman. Before I go on to that, are there any questions? No? Okay. Uh, verse 12. While the king is on his couch, my perfume releases its fragrance. Fragrance. The one I love is a sachet of myrrh to me, spending the night between my breasts. The one I love is a cluster of henna blossoms to me in the vineyards of Engedi. Now, there is a little bit of a confusion here, thanks to the CSB. It makes it sound like it's saying something that it's not saying. What was between her breasts? <laughs> it sounds, based on the CSB, that it's the guy that's between her breasts, but that's not how it is. It actually kind of clarifies itself, which I don't know how it got past translation like this. <laughs> if you look in the NASB, it has it worded better. Um, the one I love is, um, is a statute of myrrh to me. Now, the myrrh is, is between my breasts. The idea here is, is multiple. First off, um, in drawing attention to her breasts... She's drawing attention to the fact that she is in love with him, which I think is something that people do oftentimes when they're <laughs> intimate with awkward. each other. Uh, but then besides that, um, it's the idea, another thing is that it's close to uh, her heart, which is another translation. I don't really favor that one, but it's possible. Um, then the next idea was um, the one I love is a statue of myrrh to me, um, something that is um, um, pleasing to her, kind of like that. Um, I don't know how else to say that. So, anyways. Well, I, 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 like you, I think he, I think she was talking about the guy because, uh, you know, he smells good. And, and, uh, yeah, more just it. talking about his attributes, yeah. Well, he's got his, he's got his like, perfumes and yeah. things and stuff like that. So, yeah. Then, uh, verse 15. It switches to the man again. How beautiful you are, my darling. How very beautiful. Your eyes are doves. Now, what does that mean? So, uh, doves uh, have a, a series of different meanings based on uh, the Middle East. There's two main ones that I will present to you, and you can make heads or tails of it. Uh, first off, a dove can be a symbol of innocence. Uh, in other words, she's innocent, which can carry the kind of idea that she's naive, or it can kind of carry the idea that she isn't um, a whore. It can carry either sure. idea there. Um, or there's another meaning which is completely contradictory of what I just said, and that's doves more as in the sense of seducing or maybe her character. There was a, kind of this idea that the windows were the, and the eyes were the window to the soul, which kind of still carries on to today. Um, and so you could see in a woman her character through her eyes. 
And so to say her eye, her eyes were doves can either uh, carry the idea that she is a seducer, that basically he's just head over heels over how gorgeous this woman is, or um, that uh, she just has a really good character. So you well, can take that and do what you want with it. In the Proverbs, he, he, ta- he kind of he warns his kids about uh, going near Harlot's houses and don't let her allure you with her eyes. And stuff yeah, like that. So, yeah. yeah. I, get, I get where he's coming from. <laughs> you know, the same thing can that's good for marriage is very destructive, <laughs> very <laughs> destructive in other situations. Yeah. Okay, so uh, verse sixteen through uh, actually through the end of that um, chapter, it goes back to the woman again and says, "How handsome you are, my love! How delightful! Our bed is verdant. The beams of our house are cedars, and our rafters are cypresses. I am like a wildflower of Sharon, a lily of the valleys." So there's a few things that's going on here. First off, I'm sure that you guys have heard a hymnal, an old hymn, that the church used to sing about. Um, he's the lily of the valley talking about God and making this basically an allegory between God's love for his people. Well, there's a few problems with that song. First off, it, it's Solomon's not the lily of the valleys. The woman is the lily of the valleys. So the song should actually be worded, I'm the lily of the valleys. He's the bright, bright morning star. So there's... Kind of a little bit different there. But then second off, once again, Song of Solomon isn't about God. It's about love. So there's that whole issue there. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> there, there is that. Um, but then also there's a, kind of another idea, and I'm going to get into this in just a second. The lily of the valley is, is – it's a common flower. It's a wildflower. It's like a weed. So calling God a weed might not be the best of ideas. <laughs> just throwing that out there. Uh, so anyways, back to the verse here. Um, come on now. There we go. Uh, so the idea here is that compared to the grandeur that she was seeing, you know, in, in Solomon's temple and out, you know, around Solomon, she just felt so insignificant. You know, I imagine that him having a harem probably didn't help. Right. Just throwing it out there. But anyways, um, you know, she just felt so completely inadequate. Um, so she saw herself as a wildflower in comparison to um, this. I mean, look at how she says the other stuff. How handsome you are. She's talking about him. How delightful. Then she goes to, to our bed is verdant. Uh, the beams of our house are cedars. Now, there's a lot of comment, uh, commenters that think that she's, he's, she's not actually talking about house here. She's talking about out, outdoors, um, being outdoors with him and about you know the, the, um, um, the beams of our house are cedars. In other words um, – we are outdoors in this literally cedars, not talking about something that is made out of cedars, but literally saying the cedars are that. Um, so there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a thing there. Um, however, this doesn't necessarily mean once again that they were having sex or not. This doesn't really comment one way or another. Um, if she is talking about a literal literal bed, she could be talking about what she will inherit when they get married, or she could also be talking about um, more once again going on a fantasy, you know. So it doesn't necessarily demand the idea of sex. It really, there's nothing in the book itself that tells us that they ever had sex before marriage. In fact, it seems to imply the exact opposite uh, based off of some of the dialogue that's said. Uh, but anyways, and so his response to her saying, I, I feel like a weed in comparison to, to all this you know, greatness around me is uh, the, one of the smoothest lines of all time. Guys, write this down in your, in your pickup lines. Like a lily among thorns, so is my darling among the young women. In other words, she just said, I feel like nothing more than a common wildflower. And then he comes back with, ah, you say a lily of the valley as I say a lily among thorns. Bam, smoking, he's on fire. <laughs> um, so in other words, can, can, rather than, he would kind of, now this is, this is actually kind of neat how he does this because she's so focused on, on this that she's kind of getting a little bit insecure in this. And so he validates. It's her insecurity by instead of saying, that's stupid, why do you feel insecure? He instead ropes her back in by validating herself and comparing her rather than all this greatness she's seeing around her by comparing her to the other woman. Now this could also, once again, have an added dimension because he did have a harem. Right. So in other words, even yeah, though I have all these women to have sex with, you are actually special to me. So once again, polygamy wasn't necessarily quote-unquote – it was wrong. Okay, so let me let me kind of watch how I word this. Polygamy at the time was practiced among kings, regardless of what it was said in the law or whatnot. Okay, um, but still, that would be very validating for a woman. 
who is entering into a situation that she's very unfamiliar with. Remember, she's just uh, a vineyard caretaker, and she's going from that ruggedness into this splendor of the king's household. So it's it's very, very new to her. From rags to riches. Yes, yeah. yes, from rags, yes. Mm-hmm. So then in verse 3 of chapter 2, like an apricot tree among the trees of the forest. Now things get very sexual here, guys. So I'm just giving you a warning. I'm so is my love among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. Excuse me. He brought me to the banquet hall, and he looked on me with love, sustained me with raisins, refreshed me with apricots, for I am lovesick. May his left hand be under my head, and his right hand arm embrace me. Young woman of Jerusalem, I adjure you. I'm sorry, I charge you by the gazelles and the wild does of the field. Do not stir up or awaken love until the appropriate time. Listen, my love is approaching. Look, here he comes, leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My love is like a gazelle or a young stag. See, he is standing behind our walls, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. My love calls to me. Boy, did you just get the idea of Romeo and Juliet here? I mean, yes. goodness sakes. <laughs> uh, there's, no, that's, that's crazy. I wonder, I, I seriously wonder if that's how, uh, who, who wrote that? Shakespeare. Shakespeare. If you got it from this, partially. Um, so the idea here is that Solomon is a rare find, like an apricot tree among the trees of the forest. So you have the trees of the forest, and I know where you have this nice apricot tree, which is good for shade and has fruit. How about that? Pine trees, they, they don't really have, you know, trees of the forest, they don't really have fruit. <laughs> they have needles. <laughs> so, uh, so here we have a few things that she draws attention to that... Um, have obviously a bigger uh, application than just this song itself. These are three things that all women really crave. The first is, um, she says here, uh, I delight to sit in his shade. Now, the shade is symbolic for protection um, and comfort, that kind of idea. So there, there's obviously one thing that literally every woman wants. It doesn't matter if a woman is dominant or passive or whatever. Every woman wants to feel like her man um, you know, is there for her. There's that. So then the second thing, she says, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. Um, his fruit is the idea of intimacy, not not necessarily sex. Okay. Um, it, it, for those of you who have been married, you know that for women, love and intimacy means a whole lot of other things than it means to a guy. <laughs> whole lot of other things. To a guy, intimacy is let's have sex. To a woman, it's oh, so much more than that. Uh, <laughs> anyways. And then the, the, the third thing, which I know sounds terrible, but PDA. <laughs> he brought me to the banquet hall, and he looked on me with love, sustained me with rage. The, the idea of not hiding um, the way you feel about a woman. Women don't necessarily want PDA. I'm not trying to say that. Some women do. But the idea here is that women kind of crave for a man to not be ashamed of her. I mean... Who has ever dated someone who was ashamed of them and thought, hmm, I would like to continue this conversation? I mean, that's just not something that people feel. <laughs> so, uh, sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apricots, for I am lovesick. There's a few things here. First off, um, these are kind of uh, what's called aphrodisiacs of the time. Um, sex inducers, uh, things that made you conjure sexual imagery in your head. <laughs> I don't know how else I can say this, guys. Yeah. Um, but then also there's a double meaning here. Um, because she is lovesick, she feels faint, so she needs the energy from fruit. But also there's the kind of implication that she's desiring sex, yeah. which makes you weak. See what I mean? So there's a kind of whole hidden thing here that they're they're really looking forward to. The... Have you guys ever seen Arrested Development? No. There's, there's this part where, where um, the son's girlfriend is all like, you know, we're going to wait till marriage. But then on that night, when we get married, and she starts going all crazy about, you know, oh, it's going to be so awesome. And he's just like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> and that's kind of the idea here. She's kind of just getting a little bit carried away here. <laughs> um, but, yeah, right, seriously, <laughs> calm down. <laughs> um, okay, so that takes us to um, the next thing she says here. Um, well, let me just kind of, uh, there's a few things here. Uh, gazelles and does were companions of the gods. So when she says here in um, verse 7, Young women uh, of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and the wild does of the field. She's saying um, it's it would be equivalent to a pagan saying, By the gods, I charge you by the gods. You know, that, There's that kind of an idea. Now this is where we start to see um, F- uh, Solomon's um, 
what is it called? The impact that Solomon's lifestyle had 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 on him at this point. He's already comparing, you know, her to the to Pharaoh's horses and stuff, showing that once again he was tied with Pharaoh there. Uh, but then besides that, um, you know, he was obviously very well acquainted with the other um, religions of the area, um, as we see in uh, First Kings, I think it is. Um, but then we see here also she has to literally will herself to hold back from doing something that she knows she sh she shouldn't yet. Um, and it says here in seven in seven young women of Jerusalem, I charge you, do not stir up or awaken love until the appropriate time. So here she's talking about may his left hand be under my head and his right arm embrace me. So there, she she's talking about like full on hardcore making out here, you know. Which uh, then in verse seven we see her literally having to stop herself from going further, um, which I think every young person has always has experienced once before. Now it is very important to give a little bit of context here. If you read in Genesis, there's a story about one, about Israel's only mentioned daughter. Her name is Dinah. What an ugly name. Uh, I always think of the cat, but I guess that's just me. <laughs> and um, she ends up uh, having sex with the one of the um, city kings, uh, city leaders, city chiefs, whatever, uh, sons. And they get he, – he tries to get her as his wife. Um, and the brothers – Specifically, I believe it's Levi and Simeon, um, go and slaughter the whole town. I mean, they just kill everybody. Mm -hmm. And the I and their their defense, J Jacob gets all kinds of upset. He says, "You've made me an odor to these people. The Canaanites are going to join against us. They're going to jump us. They're going to kill us. We're, we're ruined. You 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 guys really should have thought, thought this one through." And they make this response back to Jacob. They said, "We couldn't have done nothing. He treated our 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 sister." like a whore and the idea here isn't that she was raped there's really little in the in, in it to warrant that now i know most translations translate it like she was raped but it seems like the idea here isn't necessarily that she was raped the the point being that she had sex outside of wedlock when they wanted her to have been properly married off that's the whole idea there. Yes, it was also a bad thing that she was raped, but their main focus, if she was raped, once again, the translation is a little bit wonky there. Um, it really does allow for either translations. Um, but if she was raped, that wasn't really their main concern because you could fix that back then. Back then. Once again, back then. I'm not trying to make light of rape nowadays. But back then, if you uh, took a vir took virginity away from a virgin, um, there was it was kind of like a not good thing for her. It, it ruined her chances of a future family, which ruined her chances of being provided for, um, because that really was how you got security. As a woman, um, it really, really was a man's world. So if you got married off, specifically younger, the younger the better, because then the father wouldn't be burdened with you. Um, the the not, not ownership. People have this idea that in the, in the time of the law that women were property. That's completely false. That's a modern-day invention that they attribute to the time. Women were not seen as property. But there was this idea of man, uh, men being over the household as, as guardians, not necessarily as tyrants, although obviously men do very easily become tyrants, um, where a man had to protect. And so literally you were transferring protection from the father and the sons to the new spouse. Okay, you kind of transfer that. Now, it was expected for women to do that, but Genesis tells us something that completely blows the imagination. Imagination. It says, a husband, a man, and a woman should become one. The 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 man should leave his mother and father and become united with, with his wife. See, why that's so important is because the Bible says, okay, you everybody knows that women have to leave their mother and father. You men also have to leave your husband and father. The idea here is that there was oneness in the marriage, which brings a very big problem to people who think that a man being the head of the household means that he gets to be the tyrant of the household. Those are two different things. Now, we don't have time to get into that, and it really takes us away from the point here. But my, but my main point being there, Jacob was supposed to be the protector of Dinah. Okay. Then his sons after him were supposed to carry on his enforcement. They were basically like his arms. That's how the family unit worked. So um, the issue there being sex before marriage. So as that applies to this, 
we can pretty confidently say they probably didn't have sex with sex outside of marriage. Not only does does it pretty pretty well make that pretty clear, especially in verse seven, do not stir up or awaken love until the appropriate time. <laughs> but then also there's the idea of the custom of the of the time, which would have shamed her. It would have shamed her in front of her family, in front of Solomon, and Solomon was the one who's going on and on about how much he loves her. So the chances of him publicly shaming her are pretty pretty low. Um, anyways, so going back to this. <clears throat> By comparing Solomon to a gazelle or a stag in verse 9, my love is like a gazelle or a young stag, she's talking about how he's strong, how he's agile, how he's attractive. Um, in other words, she's watching him come up. She's at the window, looking outside, waiting, just waiting to catch a glimpse of this guy. And then she sees him galloping up. Man, I can just <laughs> totally see Romeo and Juliet here. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, and uh, here he comes up, and she's like, oh, he's so gorgeous. He's just so wonderful. Isn't he so wonderful? So then she starts texting all of her friends, Solomon's so wonderful. <laughs> so then in uh, uh, this whole section here, it's more just the young lovers that are running to each other's embrace. Um, 10b through uh, 14. Uh, we're getting cl pretty close to where we're going to end for the night. Uh Okay, so verse 10 uh, through – so, okay. We ended at, at the beginning of verse 10, my love calls to me. Now the next line is from Solomon, not from her. Arise, my darling, come away, my beautiful one, for now the winter has passed, the rain has ended and gone away. The blossoms appear on the countryside, the time of singing has come, and the turtle dove's cooing is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs, the blossoming vines give off their fragrance. Arise, my darling, come away, my beautiful one. My dove in the clefts of the rock and the crevices of the cliff, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is uh, sweet and your face is lovely. So there's a lot going on here, and I'll try to be as brief as possible. <clears throat> Basically, he's asking for her to go on a walk. That's the shortened version. Um, now, in the in Israel, there's kind of two main sections of, t of time of year that you need to be aware of. The first is called um, the first rains. This is in our fall. But then there's the latter rains. This is in what we would call spring. And then there's the summer. The summer is excessively hot. Um, very little rainfall during the summer. So those are the two main periods you need you need to know about. So when he says, uh, for now the winter is past, winter isn't necessarily a great word. It's more of um, the time of the second rain, or of the latter rains, is past. So we're out of the muggy weather. We're getting into the nice uh, flowers blooming weather. Does that kind of make sense? Um, spring. Yeah, the equivalent of spring. More like... Cool summer. <laughs> yeah. But it's the same. It's You get the idea of it. Um, okay. Um, the idea here is that they get alone. Even in verse 7, my dove in the clefts of the rock and the crevices of the cliff, let me see your face. Let's get alone. Let's go for a walk. Let's just get alone and just spend time together, just the two of us. Just the two of us. Will you go for a walk with me? We can make it if we try. Yeah, right? <laughs> uh, and then in verse 15, uh, goes back to her, and I'm pretty sure this is where we're stopping for the night. Uh, catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, for our vineyards are in bloom. Now this seems to be out of nowhere, but actually has a very important point. So they're talking about getting a, getting alone and whatnot, and her response, I think, is just very a nice little appropriate transition. Now I don't know who's speaking. If it's the chorus, or if it's actually her, or if it's you know someone else, it's, it's very unclear. But either way, the point remains the same. Foxes are little destructive animals, very destructive animals. And when the old, when the Bible uh, talks about foxes, it more talks about their um, nowadays foxes are seen as sly, right? Yeah. Conniving, uh, smart, that kind of stuff. So, when, or sometimes calling somebody a fox would be calling them attractive. But in older times. Um, calling someone a fox would be calling them destructive. So there's a whole different set of ideas there. Um, so she's talking about two different – or whoever's talking is talking about two different things. First off, there's the obvious answer, the problems, the little foxes. In every relationship, there's these little foxes that come into a relationship and cause problems. In every single relationship. It doesn't matter who you're with. It doesn't matter. There's these little things. And here's the thing. Most people say, oh, no, the little things don't matter. Ah, contraire. In relationships, it's all those little things that add up to big things. When, when you're dating someone, there's just little things that irritate you, and you think, oh, I'll be able to change him or her. 
that's not going to happen. Just let me tear that bandaid off as quickly as possible. You're not going to be able to change them. You won't be able to convert them. It's just get over it. So now that we've gotten past that, those little things that maybe even you like about them will become those big, glaring things that irritate you about them. Oh, Gracie's laugh is so cute, then you get married. Oh, I freaking hate her laugh! <laughs> See what I mean? Those little things become big things. See what I mean? And all of that, but also little things become big things in a different way. Um... He's a little bit selfish, but I can I can love him anyways. Well, then you get married and you're like, dear God, this guy is is, is selfish. It's always about him. He never he doesn't even care about me. He doesn't listen to anything I say. Those little foxes destroy. But then also there's another idea here that she's saying, which I think is even more uh, apropos, uh, pointed, uh, pointed. Uh, and I think maybe uh, something that 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 was more contextual too. Um, the sexually aggressive men. The men who tra try to come in and sweep the girls off their feet, but it's just destruction. All that they want to do is have sex and move on. Watch out, Solomon, for these guys that are just trying to take what's not theirs. Um, really, a, a really, really great, um, great little verse there. That's probably my favorite verse in Solomon because it has nothing to do with sex and it just has to do with being on your guard. And that's very applicational. So which, the, which verse is it? Uh, verse 15 of chapter 2. And that's something that ever, even you single guys, single people uh, can, can take home with you. Rem remember that verse, the little foxes. Remember that. So just a few little practical helps um, that we can... Uh, remember why you got together when you're in a relationship and you start hitting problems. Remember why you got together. I don't think it's a mistake that the beginning of Song of Solomon talks about engagement and the end talks about married life. Because sometimes in married life, all you need to do is remember the engagement period. Uh, remember why you got together. What was the driving force? And sometimes people say something real stupid. They say, I don't even know why I got... Okay, yes, I, I know that right now you're so irritated with them or whatever that you think you, lo you hate them, whatever. Just, it really does take a full effort. Um, another little practical help, make time to be alone. This is something that people neglect to do once they get married, which is a huge mistake. When, when you're when you're dating, you all you know you try and get alone together. It, it's like you just want to be around each other. It's not always about sex, but somewhere along the way, people just kind of get a little bit confused and they start thinking that everything's about sex. I think what it is is because we let life get us so bogged down that we forget about sex altogether, and so then we become so sex deprived that we're like, dear God, I just want to have sex with something. <laughs> anyway, so make time to be alone together. Um, next, notice the good things. You know, we don't see in these verses. Two people just tearing into each other. They do this wrong. They do this wrong. They do this wrong. They do this wrong. And, you know, maybe some of us married people are thinking, yeah, my spouse does do that. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, notice the good things about um, about, the, about the person you're with. Um, women want to be publicly recognized. They want to be protected, not sheltered, but knowing that someone has their back. There's a big difference between being in, in that sense. And they want to be intimately known as well as to be intimately known. I'm sorry, they want to intimate... I said that wrong. They want to intimately know you as well as be intimately known by you. Sometimes men try to do this thing where they live as guarded as humanly possible in a relationship. So like they'll... they'll no, I, I got it covered. I don't need your help. You know, or uh, I don't want to talk about it. Or they get home from work and, and instead of and talking to, to their spouse about the issues, they're just like, no, I just, just leave me alone. Well, that's... Maybe they're afraid of being hurt or something. Right, and I understand that, but remember that women are afraid too. And for a relationship to work, it has to be two people actually committing to each other. And uh, especially as men. See, women were never charged with the task of being Christ-like to their husbands. Men were specifically charged with being Christ-like to their wives. That means that men have a greater responsibility in the marriage than a woman does. Pretty, pretty, pretty intense there, isn't it? So anyways, um, women do want those kinds of things, and for a man to not give it to them, you are starving them of love. You're asking for a problem in your relationship. Um, remember these things if you ever plan to be in a relationship. Uh, men are drawn to appearance. Women are drawn to character. <laughs> um, not always the case, but trust me, after those first feelings fade, things change. You might get with someone because you think they're just so gorgeous. But remember that looks don't last for forever.
Let me just throw a hypothetical situation by you, okay? Let's say I'm the best looking man in the history of the world. There's never been and never will be a man as gorgeous as I am. Uh, so Gracie marries me because I'm just so drop, drop dead gorgeous. And then on my way home, I'm r savagely beaten by a gang of, of something, I don't know, hoodlums. And uh, they light my face on fire and cut me cut, cut off my face too. So I'm left with just a, a nasty heap of scars and nastiness. No looks left. In a state of depression, I go to food and I turn fat. And I don't exercise anymore and I just waste away on the couch. Can you still love that person if that were to happen? Point in case. So uh, we're going to stop there. Uh, I hope that this is helping you guys understand the book. I'm trying to go through it and apply it in different situations to different people groups. We've got some people here that are married, some of the people that aren't, some people that might one day be married. So it's like I just kind of want to look at this at a couple different directions, and, and hopefully you'll find something that applies to you. Um, we'll carry on next week and we'll finish off the engagement period and go into the um, actual wedding procession. Um, so any questions before we stop this out for the night? Why was this book written? We will get to that as soon as we finish it up. <laughs> as soon as we finish it up. Can we talk about that next week? No. <laughs> we won't talk about it next week. We're going to talk about when well, we I'm finish gonna up. I'm going to go online and listen to it. Anyway, oh, okay. So. Uh, we're going to we're going to talk about that after um, we finish up the last section. Um, so that would be in like three weeks or two we two to three weeks because this is that first week. So two to three weeks we'll talk about it. Um, so okay. Anything else? Um, actually, yeah. I yes. Go ahead. Have a um, observation. In one thirteen, it talks. You know, the satch of a uh, myrrh between mm -hmm. the breasts. Um, between the what? The breasts. Speak up. Uh, uh, I can't hear. Actually, that's more like a necklace for like perfume. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. Yeah. He's. Yeah. That's why I was. I. I'm, I must have said it not very well. Let me. Let me try and say it differently. She's comparing him to the sat to the the thing of myrrh. Yes. That's, okay. that's what I was trying to say. I'm sorry that didn't come out like that. Oh, okay. um, and then also... What, what, was it about the breasts? <laughs> no, I can't remember. Yeah, of course you can, because all you can think about now are breasts. Oh, oh I was <laughs> there was actually... I, I was reading on Facebook about this... Uh, what were they called? Uh, it was a famous couple where the, the wife was very, very beautiful, and she got burned, like, from head to toe, and, like... It, she looked really terrible afterwards, and everybody was like, "Why don't you, you know, get rid of her and marry what? somebody else that was beautiful?" And he's like, "Well, because I married her soul, not her looks." You know, there's another story that goes along with that. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him. His name's Dave Reaver. He was a uh, Vietnam vet, and uh, he always saw himself as, you know, quite the stud. Right. <laughs> okay. So in uh, they were fighting the Viet Cong, and obviously Vietnam, duh. And uh, he was on a boat, and he went to pull a phosphor grenade. Mm. Those are the ones that keep burning. Okay, yeah. So he pulls the pin. A sniper shoots it in his hand. It lights him on fire, blows off his hand, blows off his chest, blows off his face. His ear is gone. His nose is gone. I mean, this guy looks rough. I think okay? I've seen that. Yeah, I'm sure you have. And he's made it his mission to go around encouraging teenagers. So you, chances are you have seen it. Um and uh, he gets back, and he's in the ward, and the guy next to him, his wife comes in, takes off her ring, throws it at him, says, you disgust me, and walks out. And he's waiting for his wife to come in, guys. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> that would be so frightening. Oh, my gosh. Because you know you can't go back in society. You're a freak forever as far as you're concerned. Like, right. maybe somebody might be able to accept you somewhere, but... You don't think anybody will. So anyways, uh, and she comes in, and she just checks the chart, makes sure it's the right person because you can't tell. I mean he's got no face. He's all wrapped up and, and, and stuff. And you can't tell who he is. And then she just goes over there and spends time with him. Every day goes over and feeds him and stuff. and It's just that. So finally he tried to take out his anger on her. And uh, why don't you just leave since you don't love me or something like that? And she's like, are you done being stupid? <laughs> But yeah, that same kind of idea. Um, so anyways, uh, any other questions or comments? I highly actually encourage you guys to read that book. Uh, it's called Scarred, but written by Dave Reaver. Um, he also has a DVD uh, version of it of him talking, um, which I think is just called Scars at Heal. 
Uh, and then there's, I think there's a CD that he has out. There's just different ways for different formats.